Hello everyone, welcome to your last tutorial in Biol 3465 Tropical Forest Ecology and Use. In this one I aim to introduce to you uh, to the last 20,000 years uh, history of tropical forests in the Caribbean. So I'll try and bring everything together uh, that we've learnt about in this course and apply it to the Caribbean and to Trinidad and Tobago. So what I want to look at in this particular tutorial is different uh, periods during the past 20,000 years. And as you know, 20,000 years uh, ago was the last ice age maximum. That was the time when the Earth was last coldest. And from then until now, the temperature has only gotten warmer. Okay. So we start 20,000 years ago, the last Ice Age max maximum. We look at the period 19,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago when the Ice Age ends. And we'll take a look at the state of the forest once the Ice Ages have ended. We'll take a look at how the end of the Ice Age led to sea level rise. And around this particular time with the arrival of humans in the Caribbean region. We'll take a look from about 3,000 years ago to about 500 years ago when the Amerindians dominated in the Caribbean and what sort of effects did they have on uh, tropical forests in the Caribbean. We'll take a look at when the Europeans arrived about 500 years ago, the early period of European colonization, what happened, what did they do, and then the transition into the plantation era uh, when uh, the Europeans greatly expanded their presence and their impact on the Caribbean and in particular on tropical forests in the Caribbean. Uh, finally, well, not quite finally, we'll take a look at uh, independence. <clears throat> Sorry, no, we'll take a look at the end of slavery and the collapse of the uh, plantation system in the Caribbean and the effects that had on tropical forests in the region. And then finally we'll take a look at post-World War II, 80 years ago, uh, independence in the Caribbean nations, with the rise of tourism, regeneration of tropical forests, and then subsequent degradation once again. And finally we'll take a look at how uh, some of the correlates between the area of tropical forests in the Caribbean on the different islands and the density of human population and how much energy they have access to. Okay, for this one, I'm going to be referring quite a lot to a paper. I can pull it up. Yep, Tropical Forests in the Caribbean. Uh, you probably can't see that title. Let me take it up to the title. All right, there it is part of it. Let me shrink it down so you can see it. I'll put this um, paper up in the... Uh, sorry. I'll put this paper up in my learning so you'll be able to see that. And it gives a nice overview of tropical forests in the Caribbean, how they've changed over time, and how they are being managed today. And this is by a, a big name in tropical forestry, Ariel Lugo. Uh, he's one of the big names in Puerto Rico, and he studied uh, tropical forests in the Caribbean for many decades. So, put, take a read of that paper as well. So, let's make a start then. 20,000 years ago, what was the Caribbean like? What were the forests in the Caribbean like? So, just a recap, because you know all of this already. Uh, 20,000 years ago, the world uh, was at its coldest, the last glacial maximum. Polar glaciers were at their maximum extent. The Caribbean, like the rest of the world, was at its coldest and driest. 
sea levels were over 50 meters, actually more like 120 meters lower than they are today. Let me change that right now. Over 130, 120 meters lower than they were today. So that means a lot of the continental shells were exposed and many of the Caribbean islands were actually amalgamated into uh, larger islands. Uh, because the Caribbean was at its coldest and driest, um, as you know, the, when you have colder climates, it means that convectional rainfall is not as possible, and convectional rainfall is the main way in which uh, the Caribbean receives its rainfall, or tropical climates receive their rainfall. So cooler weather means that there's less convectional rainfall, so everything tends to be drier. Counterbalancing that somewhat is the cooler weather. Cooler weather means that respiration is lower and the plants don't lose as much water so quickly because the atmosphere is cooler and cannot hold as much uh, moisture. So therefore, the cooler weather counterbalances somewhat the drier weather, but not completely. Because it's so much drier, uh, ecosystems which are more characteristic of drier environments tend to take over, and those are the savannas, the thorn scrubs, and the dry forests. So those are the ecosystems which dominate it, particularly at sea level. However, orographic rainfall was still present. So even though you get drier forests further up the mountains, you still had montane and lower montane forests, uh, evergreen with enough orographic rainfall throughout the year existing on top of the islands. And we know that that has happened because we do tend to find a lot more endemic species on top of uh, mountains on the islands. So when we look at our endemic species we tend in the region, we tend to find them on top of these mountains. And that indicates that those ecosystems have been fairly stable and existed for a fairly long time. So the organisms within them will tend to have adapted to those environments. So we can be fairly sure that we still had moist tropical forests on our montane in our montane environments, on our mountains and uplands, particularly in the Lesser and Greater Antilles, but also in Trinidad, the Northern Range, and the Main Ridge, and so on. In the Greater Antilles, there was a greater spread of cactus scrub, dry forests, savannas over large areas in the lowlands, but montane and lower montane forests were still present. The continents were joined to the mainland, what happened there? Did I just make things bigger? Right. right, so the continental islands were still uh, were joined to the mainland, as we'll see in just a minute, and some of the lesser Antilles were all joined together uh, into larger islands. All right, so if we look at some of the maps, this is two maps which I found, one with the Greater Antilles and one with the Lesser Antilles. They are approximately at the same scale now, so you can go from the Greater Antilles into the Lesser Antilles. Unfortunately, the colors are a bit different. I didn't get time to standardize the colors, but you can see some of the difference. And this is where the land is at the height of the last ice age, and the sea levels are about 120 to 130 meters below what they are today. So for instance with Florida you can see a great extension of uh, land area further to the west of Florida. Uh, in the Bahamas many of the islands of the Bahamas are all joined together uh, as the banks, the shallow banks which surround the um, Bahamas today were exposed above water. There was a lot of uh, of the banks around um, Cuba also exposed above water. Uh, south of Jamaica, there was a piece of area of land there which 
uh, emerged above water. Puerto Rico was joined on to the Virgin Islands. As we go down into the Lesser Antilles, you can see um, some of the outer uh, Antillean islands like uh, Barbuda, Antigua, Guadeloupe, uh, they uh, were situated within fairly shallow banks today so those banks were above water and so some of these islands were very much joined together. Okay. Uh, the other Lesser Antillean islands formed of volcanoes so the sides are fairly steep so the when the sea level fell uh, they didn't actually join up to other islands and but they did increase somewhat in size. Uh, Grenada and St. Vincent were a uh, exception. There is a shallow bank between Grenada and St. Vincent where the Beckway Islands and so on are all joined in. Um, so their uh, Grenada and St. Vincent were all pretty much joined together as one long island. Trinidad, as you can see, this darker gray area is, is land and this is the edge of the continental self, shelf. So Trinidad and Tobago were all part of the continental shelf. So the whole, this was all land. Um, Margarita too was part of the mainland and so on. Interestingly, the ABC islands up the top here, they were still offshore. All right. So most of these lowland areas um, up here in the Bahamas, in Florida, these banks and so on, they would have been at sea level and they would have been the driest areas. So those would be the areas where you get a lot of thorn scrub. I think I've got pictures of the different ecosystems, yeah. All right, here's a, another picture of um, uh, the Caribbean and Central America at the height of the last ice age. See, you can't see Trinidad at all. It's actually part of the mainland there. And a lot of these islands are joined together. You can see the Grenada St. Vincent uh, bank there and the big joining together of the Bahaman bank and the Bahaman islands. You would probably tend to get a lot of thorn scrub in these lowland areas. In places like the Bahamas and Florida, the lowland areas there were probably savannas with the Caribbean pine. And we see a lot of Caribbean pine in the Bahamas. And there used to be a lot of Caribbean pine in Florida as well. Um, they dominated the landscape, mainly because fire was very prevalent there. And that fire didn't necessarily come from humans. It, there is a lot of lightning in this region. So there was a lot of lightning origin fires. So up in the northern Caribbean, we probably had a lot more savannas with Caribbean pine. In the rest of the Greater Antilles and Lesser Antilles, and also on the northern fringe of the South American continent, probably had thorn scrub. As you went up the islands or towards the east coast, you would tend to get more dry deciduous forest. And once you get up into the mountains, you would get your normal rainforests. All right, so looking at the changes in temperature over that period, the period from 20,000 years ago to about 10,000 years ago. So we're pretty much going on to the next slide, which is looking at the end of the Ice Age from about 19,000 years to about 10,000 years. So just to summarize, at about 19,000 years, the coastlines were very radically altered because the sea level was 120 meters below where it is now. Uh, the weather was much cooler and drier as a consequence. And so we tended to have savannas, thorn scrubs, and dry forest, where today we would tend to get more um, moist tropical forest. So it's in that context that the Ice Age ended. Okay, it took about 10,000 years to come out of the Ice Age. If we look at uh, changes in temperature here, I tried to get these scales pretty much the same. So this graph looks at uh, changes in temperature 
This is in central Greenland, uh, up in the northern hemisphere, but it'll give you a, an idea of how the temperature changed globally. And this graph down the bottom is how global sea, sea level rise, uh, how global sea levels changed over time from the glacial maximum of about 20,000 years ago uh, to the present day. So about 20,000 years ago, uh, temperatures were about 15 degrees cooler than they were that they are today. Okay, so it's a lot of fluctuations going on. There seemed to be a bit of a rise about uh, 15,000 years ago, and then a very sharp rise about 12,000 years ago. And by the time that we'd reached about 10,000 years ago, the temperature had stabilized at the levels that we see today. So from the glacial maximum, they, it tended to remain fairly constant till about 12,000 year, 12, years ago, and then suddenly it flipped. Now, it's likely that the temperature was increasing because we do see the steady rise of sea levels from about 20,000 years ago. So this um, temperature, which is rated from the um, ice cores that we drill in central Greenland will only give us an approximation, but it's likely that we had a uh, smooth increase in temperature which completed its rise about 10,000 years before present and started about 20,000 years ago. And as a result, we get an increase in sea level. So at about 20,000 years ago is about 120 meters below where it is now. And as you went through time to about 10,000, you can look at about 10,000 years there when the temperature stabilized at its higher configuration, sea level rise was about halfway through what it eventually reached. So it had risen about 60 meters uh, from the depths of 120 meters. And when the temperature stabilized, the sea levels continued to rise. And this is this lag over, um, over about 2,000 years, 3,000 years, is the result of all of that ice in the ice caps taking time to melt. Okay? So, at 19,000 years ago, the ice age began to end. The temperature in the planet began to warm up and temperatures rose and stabilized about 10,000 years ago, about the levels that we see today. So the rainfall patterns would have shifted just as quickly and finally stabilized with temperatures around the patterns that we see today. There would have been some lag, however, because um, uh, processes such as ocean currents will also play an effect on or play a, have a impact on the rainfall patterns in the region. And that may take a little more time to stabilize than the increasing temperatures. So rainfall patterns would have stabilized around about 10,000 years ago, maybe a little longer, but sea level rises uh, continued till about 7,000 years ago. And we see that in some of the uh, cores uh, that we can take in swamps in coastal areas around uh, the Caribbean. So vegetation community distributions began shifting with the rainfall shifts in the tropics. The temperature shifts uh, weren't too much of an issue. It was more the rainfall which was the big uh, determining factor of what sort of vegetation community you had there, whether it was a rainforest, whether it was a dry forest, a savanna, and so on. In the temperate zone, temperature shifts and ice melting were the big things which uh, influenced vegetation community distribution, but in the tropics, it tended to be the rainfall shifts. Um, the vegetation communities, even with the rainfall, uh, patterns being stable, 
the vegetation communities are still shifting today. So just like in the temperature temperate regions, we have species which don't uh, change their distribution very quickly because they are dispersed fairly slowly by their dispersers. They may be terrestrial mammals, so they'll only spread maybe 100 meters every year or, or every 10 years or something like that. So quite often the composition of the forests that we see around the uh, Caribbean today may be still changing. So we would get species which occur in an area where we wouldn't expect to find them. An example of that is the sandbox tree. Uh, it occurs up in one of the wetter parts of the country around Matura and it's a bit unexpected because it is a tree which is very much characteristic of dry forests but it occurs in this pretty wet area and that's likely the cause um, that's likely a hangover from the time when things were much drier in that part of Trinidad. So we would have sandboxes there. Uh, it could be that that sandbox is not holding its own and it is being outcompeted by species which got better able to take advantage of the higher rainfall, something like a Mora excelsa or something like that. In the temperate regions, we still have trees which are dispersing very quickly across the landscape. Well, and they still haven't reached the full extent of their um, biophysical envelope where they're able to survive. All right, so sea level rises began around 19,000 years ago, it's quickly reached maximum rates of rise at about five millimeters a year. To put that in context with global warming, Sea levels are rising at about one to two millimeters per year. And those rapid rates of sea level rise uh, continue until about 7,000 years ago. Uh, at that point, the sea level rise fell to about one to two millimeters per year and then finally stopped about uh, 2,000 years ago. So during that time, uh, as you saw, all that land was joined together and so on. And humans were uh, able to move around a bit more easily. Particularly on the continental islands like Trinidad, as you could see, people could just walk across to Trinidad. So, expanding on that, the arrival of people. So, 9,000 years ago, the temperatures had stabilized, the rainfall patterns had stabilized, uh, the sea levels were still rising, but at about 4,000, well, about 2,000 years ago, uh, sea levels had stabilized. So during the period um, of time, human, during this period of time, humans arrived. And I think there's about a... Um, a period of time. I think the first evidence of humans in the Caribbean is about 4,500 years ago. Okay, so people arrived then. I think I've got that here. Oh no, about 6,500 years ago, the Autoroid uh, Cassiromoid peoples arrived about 6,500 years ago, or well, the first evidence is detected around that time. So that would have been when sea levels were still rising. Um, local peoples uh, tended to settle in coastal areas because that gave them two different sets of ecosystems to get their food from. You could go fishing when the food wasn't available on shore, and you could get food on shore when the fish weren't available. So having settlements on the coastlines was the thing to do. But because of that, archaeology is very difficult in the Caribbean because a lot of those settlements were drowned as the sea level rise rose up until about 2,000 years ago. So a lot of those archaeological sites are now underwater. We can say that there was some influence of these early peoples around uh, 6,000, 7,000 years ago. 
uh, because there was def uh, some of the megafauna, like such as giant sloths, uh, giant owls, and so on, on the um, Greater Antilles, were lost around this particular time. We didn't. We saw them disappear from the fossil record. It could be too that with the change in vegetation communities, some of it may not have been due to shifts in rainfall patterns and may actually be due to humans doing things like burning in an area. Certainly in Trinidad, uh, the western parts of Trinidad along the Gulf of Paria uh, were thought to have natural savannas at the time, according to the British, when they took over in 1797. I'll show you the map which uh, seems to state that. So it could be that humans had ex uh, increased the extent of savannas at the expense of dry forests due to human burning practices. Okay. Another consequence of people tending to preferentially settle around the coastlines of islands is that the forests, particularly the moist forest and the interior of the islands, tended to be relatively intact. So people didn't go in there and clear them and settle them. Instead, they would just visit these areas, take what they needed, and then go back to their coastal settlements. Okay, So forests were likely not heavily impacted by the uh, lithic communities of humans, which were around from 9,000 to 2,000 years ago. Uh, because they tended to focus on the coastal areas. So what were some of these people? I've got some lists of names of the different uh, types of Amerindians. And as you can see, there were changes or there were waves of settlement of the Caribbean. And most of those waves of settlement of different Amerindian peoples tended to start in the South American continent, pass through Trinidad, and up the Lesser Antillean island chains to the Greater Antilles. The different peoples uh, could be identified in the um, fossil record or the archaeological record by the different types of tools they used and also the different types of pottery from the about the Salaladoid Barrancoid uh, uh, peoples, they were the ones which started with the pottery and the different types of pottery allowed archaeologists to say that different communities were taking over from one another. So the oldest communities were the uh, Autoroid, Casmerioid peoples and they were in the Caribbean for the longest about 4,000 years before they gave way to the Saladoid Barrancoid peoples who then gave way to the, uh, however you pronounce that, and the Mayoids uh, just before Europeans arrived. Okay, let's call them Tainos. All right, so these different peoples successively colonized the Caribbean. Uh, either incorporating the people that, which were there before or taking over from them and replacing them. Um, these peoples tended, as I said, to come from South America and they did tend to be or tend to use waterways and canoes as their main uh, main method of getting around. So they were very much a water-based people. So they did not tend to move away from the coasts. And they used their canoes and the waterways, be it rivers in mainland South America or oceans in the Caribbean. They used these waterways and their canoes to trade and to communicate and to just generally socialize with one another and to conduct warfare and, and all of those 
various things. So I read in one paper that um, it seemed like uh, the in Trinidad, the Amerindians who had settlements on the west coast of Trinidad, they had more in common and more to do with the people in Venezuela, say on the western side of the Gulf of Paria, than they did with the Amerindians who lived on the other side of Trinidad in the east. And in fact, there was very little contact between the western Trinidadians and the eastern Trinidadians because uh, simply to get around, uh, you would have to row in your canoe all the way around Trinidad and it was much uh, quicker and easier to just go across the Gulf of Paria or to the Orinoco instead. All right, so so about 3,000 to 500 years ago, you had the different waves of Amerindians. At the time, temperatures and rainfall were stable, sea level stable, vegetation communities largely stable, but some species still invading or dropping out uh, as time went on. There were waves of invasions of Amerindians of different cultural groups. Most came up from the Amazon basin along the Orinoco and Essequibo, up through the Lesser Antilles and the Greater Antilles, and dispersed using canoes and so on. Settlements were mainly on the coast, and a lot of the archaeological evidence has been lost. So there's a canoe, okay? So for those of you who didn't know what a canoe was, that's a canoe, okay? And that's how the Amerindians spread throughout. This map here is quite an interesting map. I think it's called the Mallet Map. It was drawn in 1797 by a chap or a surveyor called Mr. Mallet. And it was commissioned by the British when they took over the island from the Spanish. And it's got some interesting uh, annotations on it. So these words here say incorruptible and impenetrable forest. And that uh, remains the same for most of the northern range, pretty much all of the east of Trinidad and the, the south east of Trinidad. So most of these forests were untouched. And this, remember, is about 300 years after the Spanish had arrived in Trinidad. In the western part of Trinidad here, there are annotations saying that these areas were covered by natural savannas. And that may be where the Amerindians, and there's still Amerindian villages recorded in these areas, this may be the area where Amerindians burnt regularly and replaced dry forests with um, savannas, okay? But I've got some other pictures here uh, of Europeans first arriving in the Caribbean. So you can see some first contact pictures there between the Europeans and the Amerindians. And during those early days, the first hundred years or so, I put this picture here of um, Port of Spain just to show how small it was surrounded by forests and plantation, well, forests mainly, a little bit of agriculture. Um, but that tended to be what the European settlements were like for the first hundred years or so. So they arrived about 500 years ago and started massive change, uh, changes to the forest of the islands, but not at first. And all through this time, the the climate was still pretty stable. So the early Europeans, when they first arrived there, were looking for the quick buck, like good capitalists. And uh, to get the quick buck, they were looking for gold. There was none on the uh, Caribbean islands, or the islands of the Caribbean, or the coastal Caribbean. So the early Europeans, aka the Spaniards, they tended not to settle there. They just moved on to the Spanish mainland, uh, South America and Central America, and looked for the gold there. So for the first hundred years of European colonization, Europeans only set up small settlements on the coast, again on the coast, practicing small-scale agriculture and staying in communication and servicing passing ships through the region, which quite often just passed through on the way to 
uh, the South American mainland. The interior forests again were not disturbed and just generally the forests of the Caribbean lasted up until about the early 1800s. No? No, for the first hundred years, so the early 1700s. And then things began to change. Uh, more uh, settlers, European settlers, began to arrive and all the areas in the continent had been explored for gold, all the gold which was going to be found was found, so the Europeans began to look at other ways of making their money. All right, I'll come back to that map in just a minute. So that was about 400 uh, years ago, about 100 years after the Europeans have arrived. Communication and travel between the Caribbean and Europe had improved and European Europe and North America had developed a market for Caribbean products such as sugar, cocoa and spices. So communications and travel, so improvement in shipbuilding, navigation and such like, uh, enabled shipping of goods from the Caribbean back to Europe to be done much more reliably. And so products, Caribbean products like um, sugar, cocoa, spices and fruits uh, began to appear much more in uh, European markets and they increased in demand. And so Europeans could make a lot of money producing these goods for sale in Europe and North American markets. So uh, on good entrepreneurs started expanding the agricultural holdings in the Caribbean. And a plantation model began to be adopted for many crops, particularly sugar. And this plantation model expanded and expanded, got bigger and bigger to make more money. And they adopted practices, first pioneered in Brazil, of using slave labor as the cheapest labor that they could find. And because of that, they cleared many areas of lowland tropical forest to make way for these plantations. So, in many islands, if the island was flat, the tropical forests, which would have been mainly dry forests, were cleared almost completely. So, places like Barbados, Antigua, uh, Anguilla, the whole island was cleared of its forests and planted up to some sort of agriculture. No, actually, not, not very much Anguilla because that's a bit too dry there. Okay. So it was during this period that the Caribbean forest suffered the most. Uh, Europeans coming in and making their buck by expanding plantations. All of this relied on cheap labor. If you didn't have cheap labor, the whole system could not be made economical. And that cheap labor came in the form of slaves. First of all, Amerindians were pressed into service as slaves. And then when they, because the populations were never too big, um, the Amerindian supply ran out. So they turned to African slaves. And a system was set up which allowed uh, entrepreneurs from Europe to make money over a three-part system in the North Atlantic, which you've probably all heard of. So there's a picture of a plantation system. In particular, in this case, it's the sugarcane. So you can see slave labor there uh, harvesting sugarcane. And this is the tripartite system, which was set up in this area, which helped support um, the plantation system in the Caribbean. So entrepreneurs in Europe would um, stock up with manufactured goods, mainly textiles, cloth and metal goods, and ship them down to West Africa, where they would be sold to the Africans, 
and in return uh, the ships would stock up with slaves which they would ship across the Atlantic open, Ocean and sell in the Caribbean and in North America and they would then stock up with goods from the West Indies um, what is grown on plantations like sugar, um, tobacco from North America, spices in the West Indies and that would be shipped across to Europe once again. So these ships were full on all parts of their journey around the Atlantic. They were making money here, making money in the Caribbean and then making money back in uh, Europe. So it was a very uh, lucrative system of trade for the Europeans who owned the ships. Um, but it was fairly fragile and it relied on situations remaining the same. As soon as slavery was outlawed, then going to the west coast of Africa became less attractive. So people began to trade more between Europe and the West Indies and North America. And the whole idea of uh, the labor on the plantations uh, became a lot more expensive, which undermined the economic uh, viability of the plantations. Coupled with that, the ships no longer uh, had such a lucrative triangular trade and therefore there were less ships because there was less of a market uh, for goods and so on. So the whole plantation system in the West Indies and North America began to die out. Okay. So about 80, uh, 180 to 80 years ago, before the, um, the Second World War, uh, from about the middle of the 1800s, the 1860s, up until the Second World War, plantation agriculture began to collapse. Uh, the end of slavery marked the end of the success of the plantation model as labor and transport to markets became more and more expensive. And even the near slave-like indentured labor brought in from uh, India, were proved to be too expensive. Uh, the freed slaves refer, uh, refused to come back to the plantations and work as um, plantation workers because they wanted to get away from that place and you can't really blame them. And they established themselves more in subsistence agriculture or fishing communities or other livelihoods, anything but working on the plantations. So Many plantations were abandoned, they went broke, or they tried other novel crops, things like cocoa, which tended to work at least for a while. And um, quite often tropical crops began to be replaced by temperate equivalents. So for instance, sugar um, tended to be replaced by beets, sugar beets, which were grown in temperate regions. Uh, goods like rubber, uh, began to be synthesized artificially as well. So rubber plantations were not, not no longer needed. So these abandoned plantations, these plantations which were no longer making money, were abandoned, and they began to regenerate to semi-natural forests, leading to an expansion of forests in several areas of the Caribbean. In particular, places like Puerto Rico saw a big expansion back again of forests. Trinidad also um, uh, suffered this economic undermining of the whole plantation system and a lot of the plantations around Trinidad reverted back to forests. So at this particular period, about the mid-1800s up to the Second World War, you actually had an expansion of tropical forests as they recovered more from that plantation era. So, after the Second World War, two main events, um, independence, um, but also increases in 
uh, the ability of uh, people to move around the globe in aeroplanes and big boats. And that caused a further depression of plantation markets, uh, particularly as independence usually mean, meant a, a no longer being able to sell as cheaply in so-called domestic markets within a colonial system. So, for instance, in Trinidad, uh, selling sugarcane to England was facilitated, maybe even at lower rates, lower tariffs, because um, Trinidad was nominally part of England. So you would tend to get uh, cheaper prices, sorry, cheaper production costs and no tariffs on uh, goods which were sent to Europe from uh, some of the colonies of these European countries. But with independence, that pretty much all came to an end. So uh, a lot of these goods would even um, not be able to be produced at an economic rate because somewhere else could produce it cheaper. So in many cases, abandoned forests regenerated as lowland forests in many of the islands. A loss of Europe is a preferential market for the Windward Islands. Oh, this is an example of probably which some of you may be able to remember when um, the United States through the WTO, the World Trade Organization, brought a case uh, against Europe for Europe preferentially buying bananas from the Windward Islands, and they managed to get a ruling against that. So Europe had to open up to producers of bananas from all around the world, which they did. So the American companies who ran their operations in Central America uh, were able to undercut the Windward Island producers, uh, sell their bananas cheaper to Europe, so the banana industry in the Windward Islands largely collapsed, and that led to a, the abandonment of many banana plantations on many of the islands of the Windward Islands. Tourism began to rise as the top revenue earner for many of the Caribbean islands, which also allowed regenerated forests to persist because the tourism was fairly small, at least initially, and tended to be focused on the coastal region. But as tourism grew, more people arrived, more developments were started to promote tourism and make more money off tourism. And that, again, began the cycle of degradation of tropical forests uh, once again. So you started to get hotels being built in dry forest areas, particularly dry forest areas because they were in the lowlands, uh, but also in forested areas in the interior of, island, interior of the islands. Um, things like roads being built um, to uh, allow tourists to move around the islands more, all leading to degradation of these forest ecosystems. Uh, over the past few years. Um, we must also take a look at the population densities after World War II. Population densities after World War II in the last 80 years have increased dramatically. Um, many islands, the population has uh, almost doubled. And when you have more people, you have more people trying to find a livelihood. In some places, uh, that livelihood has been found in industry or in the service sector. So in the case of places like Trinidad or Puerto Rico, uh, it hasn't had much of an effect on the regenerating uh, Caribbean forests. But in other parts of the world, uh, so for instance, St. Lucia, uh, where bananas became a very good agricultural crop, the increased population, and also the uh, improved availability of, thing, of fuels such as oil and kerosene and petrol and petrol and diesel vehicles made agriculture more mechanized and easier. So 
you could clear forests uh, more easily and maintain it more easily with this mechanization and that with the coupled growing population sizes meant that Caribbean forests really began to suffer after World War II in many islands. Not in all islands, some islands like Trinidad and Puerto Rico, as I said, also, well, actually, no, uh, Cuba was pretty bad as well. Um, you did tend to get um, more area of regenerating forests. But in other islands uh, where the socioeconomic conditions were different, like St. Lucia, Cuba was another place because they needed to grow food to support themselves because of their political position. And also Dominican Republic, uh, where uh, corruption and an oligarchy trying to make more money out of agriculture and tourism led to greater degradation of the natural forests. And then there's Haiti. Haiti was a is an odd country out in the Caribbean. It um, had a much bigger population and their socioeconomic conditions meant that they could not afford to get petrol and diesel and so their domestic energy supplies needed to be maintained from wood products and that meant harvesting forests. And so in Haiti forests began to be uh, chopped down uh, but in greater and greater numbers with their increasing population. So, Caribbean forests tended to be uh, reduced in size as population levels rose, unless those population levels were absorbed into, say, industrial or service sectors, which uh, did not use too much land. Um, so Caribbean forests began to be used not for timber anymore. They tend to be used more for stabilizing inaccessible slopes, protecting watersheds, and also protecting coastal communities against uh, disasters like hurricanes and the flooding which tended to go with that. So Caribbean forests are too small to be used for massive timber production, but they tended to become important instead for tourism, but also for watershed and water production. So last slide here, some um, graphs which uh, show uh, in the Caribbean how population density is inversely proportional to forest area. So when you have a high population density, you tend to have a very low uh, forest area. All those people need room to live, and so the forest is cleared to make room. When you have a um, high population density, you would tend to have a low forest area. Sorry, I got that wrong way around, didn't I? So this is a low population density, means that you have a large forest area. Over here, when you have a high population density, you have a low forest area. So it's an inverse relationship. More people you have, the less forests you have. Okay. So in the Caribbean, with the increase in population size, Inevitably, that tended to lead to uh, less forests, unless you lived in Trinidad or Puerto Rico, in which case um, the socioeconomic conditions allowed people to leave forests alone and move into other sectors like the service sectors, like um, uh, tourism and so on. And maybe industry like manufacturing and so on, which allow people to move off the land, not practice agriculture, and leave those tropical forests alone. So where are we at the moment in the Caribbean with Caribbean forests? Um, we would have probably about 
half the Caribbean forests that we had at the end of the last ice age when Europeans first arrived. Most of that Caribbean forest is concentrate on steeper land, uh, more of the uplands, and most of the forests in the lower regions and the flatter regions have been cleared and planted up for agriculture, but in some areas that forest has regenerated, so it is a secondary forest, uh, mainly in places like um, Cuba and Puerto Rico and Trinidad. Um, of the half forests which are left behind, the trend of those forests is a reduction in forest area as population levels go up on the islands and people intensify their efforts to extract money from the service sector, particularly things like tourism, and more developments take place. And accidental destruction of forests like by things like fire uh, due to the higher population also uh, increase. So the status of forests in the Caribbean they're, a, they're fairly, they are uh, reduced to about half of what they were. Um, the, of that, within their ecosystems, uh, they're not changing that much. Certain species may be coming in, certain species may be dropping out <clears throat> as they respond to past changes in climate. And uh, the trend of the area of those forests remaining tends to be slightly downwards um, as forests tend to be cleared for things, for developments which allow people to capitalize on things like tourism and so on. All right, I haven't mentioned global climate change in this lecture. Um, this was more of a retrospective, but if we do factor in global climate change, that is going to bring in even more changes, uh, both in terms of sea level rises and in terms of changes in the ecosystem types and distributions across the Caribbean. But as I said, I think that's outside of the scope of this particular lecture. All right. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope it's been entertaining and maybe even allowed you to understand your region a little bit more. Okay then, thank you very much. Oh, um, I do have some questions which I'm going to post uh, for you to make this into much more of a tutorial rather than just a straight lecture. Okay, then. thank you, bye.